Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to old war dreams. Uh, it's an amazing thing to realize that Whitman was able to be so far ahead of his time. And as he speaks here, we're going to begin to think a whole lot about post-traumatic stress and the way in which individuals who have gone through serious trauma are going to have serious types of mental health issues long after the fact. This is poem 17 of the 22 of From Noon to Starry Night. And as I said in a previous lecture, uh, we're, we're beginning to have some political poems now at the end of this cluster. Now our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, all the way from inscriptions up to and including a set of introductory comments to Starry Night, and as well we just finished with the uh, propaganda poem of uh, Dakota's Canyons. Now our Nortons will tell us about this poem, War Dreams, it appeared in the sequel to Drum Taps, which makes a whole lot of sense, 1865 to 66, and in the 1867 Drum Taps Annex under the title, In Clouds Descending in Midnight Sleep, end quote. The opening phrase of the first line, which was revised to its present form in 1871. The 1871 text, transferred to the Ashes of Soldiers group of Passage to India, has the title, In Midnight Sleep. Together with other minor revisions, the present title and position came in the 1881 Leaves of Grass. By the way, Norton's will point out the regularity of stanza form and the use of the refrain, I dream, I dream, I dream. Now, this is one of those poems that Whitman rarely does that kind of thing, where he uh, plays with more standard uh, form. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to be paying attention to this. Of course, his use of the word old, we saw for the first time in As I Pondered in Silence, Old Lands, uh, war dreams as a phrase is only used one time and it's here, but you'll remember dreams from uh, sleepers is significant. You'll remember that he says, I dream in my dream all the dreams of other dreamers, right? And so this idea of dreaming is significant. It is interesting as well that Midnight will be referenced as the last poem of this cluster, Noon to Starry Night, then is simple here in terms of its placement. In Midnight's sleep, of many a face of anguish, notice the repetition of of here. In anguish, obviously, takes us back to I sit and look out. Of the look at first of the mortally wounded, of course, go back to our study of wound dresser. In other words, Whitman saw so much carnage during his time as nurse during the Civil War that it affected him in profound ways. We know that he had terrible headaches for much of his life. There's an argument to be made that being the wound dresser, the nurse during the American Civil War, led to his early um, onset of all kinds of health issues, not just physical, but also mental health issues. He says, of the look at first of the mortally wounded, of that, in parenthetics, of that indescribable look, taking us indescribable back to Song of Myself 15. In other words, as much of a word man, player, artist, poet he, as he is, there's some things he just can't put into words. They have to be somehow relived in his dreams. Of the dead on their backs with arms extended wide. We saw some of these, obviously, some of these images tragically in drum taps. Some of you saying, that's the hardest stuff I've ever read, some of those poems in drum taps. And then the first of three refrains, I dream, I dream, I dream. Again, of course, his love of trinities is self-evident. Of scenes of nature, notice capitalized fields and mountains, but unfortunately this is going to be scenes of nature, fields and mountains um, that are going to disturb him. He continues, of sky so beauteous after a storm, and of course this idea of storms will be symbolic, and at night the moon so unearthly bright, again obviously noon to starry night. Hear all the S's now, shining sweetly, shining down, where we dig the trenches and gather the heaps. Now. Uh, uh, right up to the where we dig the trenches, it's like, oh, he's celebrating the beauty of nature. That he has done, of course, in Leaves of Grass, but that is not what we're talking about here. Obviously, all the dead, all the, the need for burial, and so the trenches are dug often in the nighttime. And then, of course, his use of the word heaps takes us back to uh, France, the 18th year, right? And then, I, and then he says it for the second time, I dream, I dream, I dream. Uh, from old, we go to long. Long have they passed, these dreams, faces and trenches and fields, 
where through the carnage, remember Song of the Banner at Daybreak, Carnage, I moved with a callous composure. You'll remember this use of callous from Song of Myself 27, mine is no callous shell, and yet here it is a callous composure. In other words, for the wound dresser and for the imagined soldier who had to be a part of digging all of these graves, one becomes calloused in one's composure. Or away from the fallen. You'll remember this uh, um, when we come to it. I'll remind you of it. In Sands at 70 Cluster, the dying veteran will talk about the fallen. Onward I, spe I, onward I sped at the time. In other words, I just had to get on with things, right? But now, of their forms at night, I dream, I dream. I dream. His use of the word forms obviously takes us back to Plato's Republic and the theory of the forms. And it is, I think, a provocative poem in this regard. It captures so powerfully the way in which when one is in a setting where one has to perform, digging, for example, large numbers of graves, one just does it and moves on. But it's only after the fact. And again, this is brilliant that Whitman is pointing this out so much earlier then we were able to understand it. And of course, within the community of psychologists and therapists today, we speak, obviously, about the power of these kinds of memories, disturbing sleep patterns, sleep rhythms, obviously creating a lot of post-traumatic stress. Let's finish now at 2A. Well, I think the argument that Whitman is wanting to make is the horrors of war never, never go away. They are permanently there. And there's only a way to get through this kind of thing by talking about it, writing about it. I think Whitman, part of Leaves of Grass was Whitman's attempt to try to reconcile the things that he saw and the horrors that he experienced during the horrific war. At Tubi, I love the repetition of the I dream, I dream, I dream. And of course, in the American tradition, the idea of dreaming or having a dream, we obviously think of the great Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream. The idea that dream can be used in so many different ways. Obviously, in sleepers, for example, it can be used in so many different ways. And 3A, notice that we are more now referencing the Iliad and the Aeneid because obviously we're back to some of these martial poems. But I want to mention a couple of titles that will play off of what Whitman is doing here. Crane's Red Badge of Courage, 1895, I think is a brilliant synopsis of what it means to come to terms with events of martial battles and the like after the fact. And then uh, remarks classic All Quiet on the Western Front, the 1929 offering, which is one of the most compelling treatments of this whole idea of dealing with the trauma of what happens during uh, uh, the, the war and then, of course, after the war. Now, how are we going to own a poem like this? I, I, I can ask a couple of questions. What was the time that you had to live with bad dreams and trauma that was associated with those bad dreams? And how did you survive? Did you get help? And I want to encourage you to get help if you are engaged in that kind of thing. And then I want to point out the way in which Whitman found his way out of some of this through his writing. Um, and I think that it's one more example of the power of how art can help us to deal with uh, mental anguish, trauma, mental health. Thank you.